I am thrilled and so excited to be leading another round table for NTech Engineering. This one is Trusted Advisor or Hired Gun, how boards and councils can work best with their engineer. And one of the things we always like to do to get started is uh, introduce the panel. So I'm Christine Gonzalez. I am storage tank queen. I love when we wear my crown. There we go. Uh, storage tank queen here at Entech, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, Ed Petrovsky, he returns for the fourth time uh, to our round table. He's Entech's director of technical services with more than 40 years of experience. H. David Miller personifies Entech's longtime focus on operators when helping our clients. He's a senior project manager with Entech with 43 years of, ex of operations experience. Eric Moore has been on all sides of the table, most recently as executive director at the West Branch Regional Authority, and he's now working for Entech as a project manager. He's been in the trenches for how, how long, Eric? How many years? 25 at least. <laughs> More than 25 years. <laughs> and that's what I love. I mean, everyone looks so young and yet they're so experienced on this panel. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, next is Corey Morgan. She's been with Entech since the spring as a, as a compliance coordinator and senior project manager. And she has 30 years of experience. I mentioned our panels always work really, really well because it's not just Entech you're hearing from. It's our industry friends. And this time we are thrilled to welcome uh, Jeff Ott. Jeff's the president of Ott Consulting, and he has over 31 years of experience. And also Mike Bizignani, who's a project manager at GHD Consulting Services, and he has 15 years of experience. So before we dig deep into the questions that I know our audience has, first we'd like to hear from our audience. We always like to know who you are, um, and how we can best help you guys. So I wanna start out by uh, launching a poll and I'm gonna let the panelists vote on this as well, just so we can really see where everyone's coming from. The first poll question is what's your role? And if it's more than one thing, you can fill in a couple of them, uh, but we're looking to see, are you a board or council member? Uh, are you a utility in management or an operator? Uh, a lot of engineers out there uh, or a contractor. I almost need a line item of Bradley Cooper. I really want Bradley Cooper to join one of our panels and he's mine, Tori, he's mine. <laughs> Should have said something. I just had lunch with him. Oh. <laughs> okay. Of course Hello. you did, H, of course you did. <laughs> I will give the audience, I'll give you five more seconds. It looks like almost everyone has voted uh, or you've know, given us some feedback there. And uh, I'll end the polling now and let's look at the results. So I'll share the results with everyone. Okay, looks like vast majority, 68% are engineers. Um, but also look, uh, looks like uh, some utility management, utility operators. Okay, this really gives us a good sense. We do have a mix out there. And um, so thank you very much for participating in this. This really helps us. So I'll share the results. And now let's, um, let's just jump into this. Uh, I think it was uh, Chris Hannum in our office who had had the idea of doing uh, a round table regarding boards and how do the members of a board, how does the utility, how does the engineer, like they all have different roles, responsibilities and how do they all work best together? So first question I wanted to pose uh, to our panel is uh, tell us about your best experience working on a board, what your role was and what do you credit to that success? So Ed, you're our, probably our senior member here. Do you want to kick things off and, uh, and tell us a little bit about your experience? Well, I always think one of my best experiences, and it's my longest running experience, is with the Waymart Area Authority. And I've been their engineer pretty much continuously through uh, four different employments and since 19... 92. And, uh, you know, it used to be a small authority until the county commissioners came into a meeting one day and said, we want to bring a federal prison to town. And it was the first major project I did with them. And it was a mind blowing project because we were only going to triple the size of the treatment plant. But yet, 
you know, initially the board members were like, oh my God, how do we do it? How do we do it? And we sat there and we talked about it and we kind of rationalized what we were going to do. And we did it and it was successful. And um, we built a project in 2003 to handle what was a federal prison and a state prison. And we came along and did another little upgrade. And we just were engaged a week ago to do a study to do a big development for the county itself wants to do around one of the prisons. So we're always doing projects. It's still a relatively small authority, but it's a very great authority to work with. And I think we all have great relationships, myself with the board, NTech with the board, um, and the people there, you know, listen to us, take our advice, but at the same time, they question us. And that just makes for a better relationship. So it's very enjoyable. And the people on the board are not experts in wastewater treatment. They got all different kinds of jobs, but they all bring something to the table. And uh, it's just a real enjoyable experience working with them, has been for a long time. I, I think they enjoy working with me because they haven't told me to get out yet since 1992. So, um, so it, it, it's been a great experience and we've done great projects up there and, and we've spent a lot of project money. They don't shy away from the idea of, oh man, we got to spend a million dollars. It's just, how do we do it? And we talk it over and we get through it. So that's been one of my great career experiences, to be honest with you, working with the Waymart Area Authority. Excellent. Thank you. How about you, H. David, uh, as far as a good, ex really good experience working either on a board or with a board? Well, you know, I, I don't necessarily like this, uh, to start off and say, yeah, Ed's right. Um, but he is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so from my perspective, I mean, I've served on both sides. I mean, I mean, I'm an elected official as a borough councilman. I've spent si obviously a lot of time on the operations side and now here at Entech. So you get to see the, you know, all around the merry-go-round, what everybody's needs are, um, the cast of characters, if you will, that, that are in play. Some like Ed, I referred to, some are very knowledgeable, um, some not so much. And they know that, and that's why they hired you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to, to have some really great clients um, where, you know, again, the, the, the difference is, uh, say in one case, they say, listen, we like to do this, that, and the other thing. We like to do the civil engineering. Uh, we do stormwater, but we just don't know enough about sewer here. You take that. And that's so it just really comp, you know, we end up complementing each other. So uh, it sounds like it's yeah. a, a sort of an advantage when they don't know much about something yet recognize you do. So you can really work well together. And there has to be trust there. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, li I like to tell the story, um, you know, when I first started with these clients, um, when I was on the on the municipal side. I was a client of Entex for some time. And what I've come to find is, you know, and it, excuse me if this sounds like a sales pitch because it's not meant to be, but it speaks to the kind of person you want to engage. And, you know, I guess for all the same reasons that we hired Entech in the first place are all the same reasons why it's good to work here too. And you get to take, you know, both sides of, of, uh, you know, that service. And I already know what some of these people need. And if they don't know what they need, you get to plant seeds with them and to say, have you ever thought of, you know, whatever. It's like, no, it's like, well, we can help, we, help you with that too. Excellent. Um, Jeff Ott, give us, um, give us some idea of what's your best, best experience either working on or with a board. Um. I, I hail from the Slate Belt, so if anyone's familiar with the Slate Belt region, it runs from Portland, Pennsylvania, out to Wind Gap, uh, Pennsylvania, and in between is Bangor and Rosetto. <coughs> so um, I am the Bangor Borough Engineer. I don't handle the sewer there. 
I am the Rosetto Borough Sewer Authority engineer, which is right next to Bangor. So I always find myself uh, in, in unique situations where uh, I, I know things uh, about both clients that the other clients don't know about each other. So uh, it's, a, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Uh, and I, I use a lot of caution. Um, I, I, I love working for Bangor Borough as their engineer. I do all, all the stormwater management and all those things and road programs. And then up in Rosetto, uh, I teamed with Entech and we were uh, handling their uh, sewer rehabilitation projects. And uh, the people in Rosetto are about, you know, it's basically, it was uh, an older community. Uh, these are some of the nicest people you're ever gonna meet. And it's kind of neat because uh, some of the board members uh, knew my father, knew my grandparents. So it's more of like a family thing for them. And uh, they hired me a few years ago and I guess they had a bigger firm and they were unhappy because they kept saying, well, every time this firm came in, we could charge an arm and a leg. So they wanted to use someone local like me, and I do have a, an office up in the Bangor area. So uh, the, the the neatest experience I've had yet is when, uh, and, and by the way, my wife was from Rosetto too. So uh, all the board members know my wife's family. Uh, one night after one meeting, uh, working with Entech, we were able to get Rosetto Borough like a four hundred thousand dollar grant, and. Um, I went in there, I presented the information to the board and uh, one of the older gentlemen, these guys are like in their 80s, most of the board members, uh, he just shook my hand afterward and said, I'm so happy that you are here. And it was just a great feeling because you were appreciated. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps you going back for more. When you can do something extraordinary for a client and they really appreciate it, you just, that's why you love your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. That's why you love it. Thank you. Tori, um, tell us about your best experience uh, with, with the, either working with or working on a board. So I, I, I similar to H, um, have sat on both sides. I'm a, an elected official as a commissioner and, and also um, work for Entec, um doing environmental and engineering services. And, you know, I think one of the I can't give one exact best experience, but what I can say, what's been the best experience for me personally, what I've learned from it all is when, when you're working for an authority or a municipality, it's so important to understand what their situ what the atmosphere is in their community the, beyond the particular project. Try and try and know a little bit about that community, not all the ins and outs, but at least know a little bit about them. Because when you when you're hired by them or when they ask you to do a project, you you become part of their team. Um, they they expect you to be on board with what's going on in their you know in their whole operation and that's an amazing feeling and you can do great things. So I'll use one of the newer clients that I've been working with with Entech is um, the city of uh, Lebanon Authority. Um, and I was asked to come in and help um, work on a fats, oil and grease program for them. Um, I started with, with Ed and, um, and continued working on it. And I came in, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I've got all these great ideas. And I thought, no, you know what? I'm just gonna like, sit back and I, I met with them and we met via Zoom and then we met in person and I sat down and I talked to them. It was incredible. What an amazing group of people that had so much knowledge and so many great ideas. I found myself in a situation where, you know, of course I, I brought in some, some experience and some expertise, but I actually learned from the whole thing. We built something that made sense for them, not just a canned project. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about being open-minded and communicative and, and a good, good listener. And I think whether you sit on the, um, the, the engineering side of it or the elected official or authority side of it, it all comes down to that listening piece and knowing what the other one needs and what makes them tick to make for a true successful situation. And, and I just use, they're just one of the clients that I've been working with, but what an amazing group of people. And it all came down to listening to what they really wanted and needed, what made sense for them, and then taking any experience we had as an organization and molding it into something that, that they would make them successful. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, great story, I love it. Uh, Eric, 
tell us about your uh, good experience working with or on a board. I think my favorite experience really came from when I was a consultant. And the first time that as a, a young consultant, I was able to be the bridge between the borough council and the treatment plan operators. The borough council had a fixed idea of what their people were capable of, and it was not a particularly high opinion. Uh, but working with them uh, day after day, I was able to relate to the board uh, in a way that they could understand that, hey, your people know what they're doing. You can rely on them. And what they're telling you is, is valid. They need money and they need resources to uh, fix up the plant or you're gonna have trouble. And the first time that, uh, the, that uh, in particular um, council said, really, our guys did that all by themselves? And I was able to say, yeah, I didn't even have to help them. Uh, that felt really good to be able to be a bridge to help those two parties communicate better. And it, it helped them for years after that. Oh, I love that story. So it really speaks to the value of what's well, good communication, <laughs> really, really good communication and also trust. I mean, they trusted that what you were saying was right and they got to see the results. Excellent. Uh, and just a reminder to our audience, uh, we're taking questions throughout this. Um, we've got some stuff we'd love to talk about with boards, but more importantly, I already see there are some questions coming in from our audience. So use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen and we'll respond to those throughout uh, the round table. So uh, moving on to Mike, I'd love to hear what's your best experience either working on or with a board? Sure. So the majority of my experience has all been working with the board as a retained consultant for the board. Um, really throughout my career, starting out in Western New York, working for a really small community, the town of Wales, to, you know, a large community down outside of the city of Charlotte in North Carolina. So it's very greatly the... Uh, the level and technical expertise of the of the board that I've worked with down to, you know, just a common person that came from the town who's a member of their board. And I think, you know, I could echo everything that everyone said before me, right, that, that I agree with all of those points. And I guess one thing maybe I could add to that is, you know, the experiences that I have enjoyed the most in working as a retained consultant to a board is when the relationship with the board was professional, but also personal. And I think when it becomes a, you know, a personal connection with the people at the board, um, everything else that we talked about really falls into place, right? The, the trust, um, the gaining an understanding of what the needs are of the board or the challenges that they may be up against or just their schedule, right? And, and like what Tori said, understanding all of that, you know, is key to working successful. Um, and I think if over time you're able to make that personal connection with the people on the board, all of those pieces naturally fall into place. And it's a very enjoyable experience. Excellent, a oh, good story. Uh, so I guess in general, uh, just to sort of look at this, we've got a board, we've got the utility that's got management and operators, and then we've got well, the engineer. <laughs> so it, would, you, would you say that's the good way of putting it? There's like three different entities all trying to work together. And if so, like what are the specific roles and uh, responsibilities? Uh, I guess we'll, let's start with the board, uh, with the board. What's the specific roles and responsibility for the board members? Well, Eric? I think one of the, the first things that, that a board needs to do is understand whether it's a policy board or whether it's a managing board, an operational board. And I think um, in my experience with a lot of smaller uh, clients, they all like to think they're operational boards and uh, that's not a very efficient way to operate. It's good if you're a very small utility and you only have part-time folks or maybe one or two full-time guys and some part-time guys. And then maybe the, you know, the chairman of the board chips in uh, a few days a week. But once you get you know, above a certain size uh, and you're a decent sized borough or, or larger, you're really becoming a policy board. You're gonna have people to carry out the mission. You just have to tell them what the mission is and understand that that mission should be consistent, that you're, you're steering a cruise ship, not a dinghy. So you can't just whip the wheel and go from one direction to another. So the board's role is really to, to be the, uh, the overarching leadership 
and to provide good steady uh, leadership so that you can deal with complex infrastructure issues in a predictable way. Oh, I like that. That's a great way of better understanding it. Tori, what did you want to add? I, I couldn't agree with Eric more. Um, you know, in, in certain situations, you know, there's an operating board and, and, and a policy or a you know, more of a, um, a legislative type board. And, you know, it, it needs to be clear what that is. And, and it also needs to be clear with, you know, you had mentioned what are the different roles? Well, you know, the role of the board, the role of the operators of the utility, and then the roles of the engineer the only way they're gonna work efficiently is if the same information is communicated with every one of them. If there's a breakdown in communication between the, the utility, the actual plant operators and the engineer, and let's just say the, the operators are going directly to the board and the engineer is skipped, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's a total breakdown in, in how things can get accomplished. Um, so as, whatever position that's held in, in that triangle um, to make it effective and to make it a good communicative group, you have to be, you have to understand all those different players and um, make sure that you're, you're involved in the appropriate discussions because otherwise if there's a breakdown, I mean, you, you could think you're working on a project um, and doing all the right things and then come to find out, oh no, 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 you know, the, the, the operations team said they don't want to do that anymore. Well, nobody told us. We didn't know that. Well, whose fault is that? It's, it's not necessarily the operations team. We have a sense of responsibility to make sure that we're communicative as well and we're on top of everything that's going on. So that, that connection, it's, it can be very delicate at times, but I think once you create those lines of communication, similar to like what Mike said, once you create it, it's solid, it's there. And everybody knows who to talk to and when to talk to them. But sometimes when you start projects, no matter which position you hold in that triangle, you have to, you have to really foster those relationships. You have to make them happen. They don't necessarily just happen out of the blue. So sometimes it takes a little bit of extra effort. It takes a little bit of energy to kind of put yourself out there and say, hey, you know, I'm new here, or um, I'm, your, I'm your new engineer, or I'm your new operator. Uh, you know, I just want to make sure I have the lay of the land, understand what the expectations are of me, um, who should I be talking to, those types of things. So um, Eric's absolutely right. Okay, any other uh, comments on when yeah. it comes to the board? Yeah, Ed? Yeah, and I think it, it kind of goes on a little bit with both what Eric is saying and Tori is saying. And it goes a little bit to a question that's on your board right now where someone said, well, how do you deal with an engineer who's very technically proficient, but he doesn't have any people skills or can't explain? And, and one of my favorite phrases that and probably everyone that's here from Entech has heard me say it, know your audience and know who you're talking to. Don't go in and talk technical to a board. Uh, don't go in and say, well, this is how it works and this is how you got to do. You have to understand their role and your role. And your role isn't just because we have an engineering project, we're going to ram this down their throat make them understand what's going on and talk to them in a way they can understand. Narrow down their decisions to, this is what you need to decide on. Don't tell me what size to make the treatment tank, but would you like concrete for longevity or would you like steel? Maybe you can hit that kind of question, but also respect their opinion. What does that guy know? He's on the board. He works in a bank. This is sewage. Well, he's got his opinion and he has a knowledge that he brings to the project. It may not be technical, but embrace that knowledge, embrace that opinion and learn how to talk to the people. And that's something us engineers have to do, us technical folks have to do in order to make them understand and make them understand where we're coming from. So again, know your audience, know who you're talking to, and realize a lot of them don't know anything about sewage or water projects. But you got to put it in a way that they understand. So that helps. But that starts with you as the engineer 
uh, the trusted advisor, hopefully. That's, that's my role today, the trusted yeah, advisor. Everyone, the everyone's asking, job. why is Ed all dressed up? Are you going to a job interview or something? I'm <laughs> advisor, I'm not a hired gun. <laughs> so, so again, learn how to talk to these people so they can, you can have them make the decision they're supposed to make, okay? And then they won't start telling you how to make the nuts and bolts work. Okay, good. Corey? You know, Ed just brought up a really, really good point. You know, it's often you, and you know, I sit on a board and, and commission as well on the other side, like we talked about, but those individuals, they might not have expertise in water or wastewater or whatever engineering project you're working on, but I can promise you, they're not in that position for no reason at all. There's a reason they got on that board. There is a reason they have an interest in water or sewer or whatever board they're on. So respect that. It might not be because they're an expert in the field, but it might be because they know there's a, a larger concern in their community, whether it be economic, whether it be structural, it could be a many, many different things. That's why I said in the beginning, it's so very important to know the atmosphere of that community um, because that really is the much bigger picture that a lot of times is driving some of the projects that we as um, engineers um, might be getting hired for. So Ed is so, so right. I mean, those individuals that sit on a board or are elected officials, yeah, they might not be an engineer or a scientist or whatever, but I can assure you they have some value and some particular interest and that's why they're sitting on that board or commission. So respect it for certain. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, anyone else want to chime in, uh, Eric? Uh, it's also important, you know, on a practical level to understand your board members have, uh, you know, they've gotten to where they're at and they have a, a, an overriding duty to protect the ratepayers or the borough people. And they usually take that very seriously. If you as an engineer can't translate things to them in a way they understand, they fall back to that default position of uh, lowest cost equals best protecting of the rate payer. And so even when we know that sometimes you have to invest in the infrastructure in order to, to have the long-term lowest cost, if you can't translate that very well, they're going to default back to that frustrating state of, we don't spend any money on this because you haven't convinced us. So. Good point. Mike, did you have a comment? No, go ahead, H. David. Yeah, I think, and it, it, it uh, speaks to the question that uh, uh, somebody in the audience had asked. Um, you know, seeing that you're you're in the middle of, of the board, the operations side, and and your own firm, I think, and and I think it's okay for somebody in operations, or if you have a specific client on a board, to it, it's okay for them to practice their own soft skills and be able to say to the engineer and say, listen, I personally understand what you're saying. However, you should know about the rest of the board. And let me take a couple minutes to explain to you where they're coming from. When you start talking about this, you lose them. And you know it, it's okay to be able to point that out. And then on the other side is, um, you know, it is recognizing what, what your strengths are too. And I've, I've seen us do this where, okay, I am tech, you know, not I, but, you know, John Doe, I am technically proficient, but I don't know, I'm just not getting this point across. Somebody on your team can help you. And that's where, you know, at least from our experience, we end up backing each other up, you know, where, okay, you design it, you present it you know, type thing. So, but again, all comes down to communications back and forth and being comfortable enough to, you know, say those things that maybe e either one of us might not want to hear, but it's important to, you know, see the project through. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on the sort of the role and responsibilities of the board? Okay. And, and then Looking at the other puzzle piece when it comes to the engineer, the engineer, um, what's, is there one ideal thing that the engineer should do? Or I guess it might vary depending on the, what the board needs to do. Uh, what do you think, Mike? 
Yeah, I mean, you, your primary role there is to be a, their trusted advisor, their consultant, right? And um, it could be a project specific role, right? Where you're asked to solve a problem through a study or the execution of a design, or it could be to help uh, govern a regulatory issue or regulatory change that is gonna be coming you know, through the industry. Um, you know, your role as the engineer, depending upon the authority or the sewer district or the municipality, whomever you're representing can, can absolutely vary. Um, so, you know, part of the, 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 how you make that successful as you, as the representative, as the engineer is, uh, like David was saying, you know, finding the right people within your organization or even outside of your organization to, you know, present or work on a common solution for your client. You know, just because you are the engineer who's present at the monthly board meetings doesn't mean that you have the answer to every potential problem or challenge that they have. And I mean, I've seen other engineers in our organization myself, right, where you think you or you feel like you can answer almost any question. And I think knowing your limitations and knowing when to bring in you know, other people is critically important to the success. And that's not a negative thing to the board, right? You're, you're, you know, you're just bringing the right people to the table to solve their challenge, problem, project, whatever it may be. Um, so I think that the range of what we do as a, as a consultant to a board is really wide, depending upon, you know, who it is you're serving and what the challenge is. But, you know, more importantly, you know, is, is how we go about providing that service. Interesting. And you bring up an interesting um, question that, that I have for you guys. Uh, so it sounds like often engineer, uh, trusted advisor, but what about the idea of an engineer as a hired gun? Are there certain situations where you'd want an engineer to take on a role um, that the, either the board needs help with or the, um, the, the, the utility needs help with? Uh, have any of you guys on the engineering side been a hired gun uh, to help out a board in any way like that? You mean I like think, good cop, bad cop type of thing? Something like that. Or just like the board or utility doesn't have the skills to say manage conflict with the contractor. Contractor's not getting stuff done or um, hired gun in the way that you're, you know, you're the more the authority figure and you know, you know, good cop, bad cop. So yeah, something like that. Or, I mean, or, yeah, we, like that. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, um, I, I, work with a couple different clients where, you know, the expectation is, you know, listen, you guys go in and handle it. And if there's a, a conflict type situation, we want you to represent the authority or the borough or the township um, and, and kind of take that on head on representing the township. So yeah, I mean, we, we definitely have situations like that. And, and, and those, are, um, those are great relationships to have too, but they're also, they're also, you have to be very careful because you have to respect the rules and regulations that are in place. You have to understand the expectations of your client, understanding that they want you to push through with enforcement or something like that. But yet you also don't want to upset that balance of the relationship between maybe the borough and the business or the borough and whoever they're working for. Um, do, you, do you understand what I mean? There's a delicate balance there and they've asked you, us, whoever it is, the, the engineering service, to, um, to make sure that that balance doesn't shift. They, 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 they don't wanna handle it and that's understandable, but you're still representing them. So you need to make sure that you, when you're doing it, it doesn't go whoop. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Ed? It, it, it's interesting. Um, um, I'm thinking of something that years ago, I was asked by one of our industrial clients who makes bread and the local smaller municipal authority was charging them surcharges on the discharge and, and they were pretty exorbitant. And I got hired or by the industry to be their hired gun to go down and beat on the authority for their high surcharges. And I have to say, their surcharges were ridiculous. It wasn't that hard to fight them. They were like out of sight. But yet, here I am, I'm dealing with 
two municipal clients right now. I just calculated surcharge rates earlier this week for the uh, Oxford Area Sewer Authority. And I had to go to a meeting down there with a industrial customer who's discharging high strength waste. And I was specifically asked to come down because they thought it was gonna be a little bit of a tough negotiation. And they came in with their lawyer and the authority had their lawyer. And I did get a little feisty with their lawyer. If their lawyer's listening, I apologize. I, you know, but I did have to drive two and a half hours to go to that meeting and it was very tense, okay? so. And I have another client up in the Poconos that has a microbrewery and you can't believe the wastewater that comes out of microbreweries. And I'm trying to deal with surcharges up there. And they're also, I'm working with the solicitor, but I'm still kind of a little bit that hired gun. I mean, I've been their engineer, but now it's a specific problem and I'm sitting at the table and they're coming in with their lawyer, not just their technical guy. So yeah, we get to be hired guns. And I've been around long enough that I've been a hired gun on both sides of the table. That's cool. So, um, what, 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 as far as being a hired gun, Ed, what do you attribute to your success uh, in, in being asked to take on that role? Actually, I, I think the success is that I know both sides of the table. I'm arguing for an industry to lower a surcharge and I can look at a surcharge and say, <laughs> Yeah, it's reasonable or wait a minute, you're trying to make half your budget off this industry. So, you know, I come armed with that knowledge because I know how the municipality is calculating their rates. At the same time, if one of the hired gun for the municipality going against an industry, uh, you know, I, I know the things to say to that industry, because if it's a proper surcharge, I know what goes into it and I know what makes it legitimate and reasonable. And I can sit there and say to the industry, well, you want to go do this treatment yourself, go ahead. But if you think you can do it cheaper than us, you're going to learn real quick you can. So, yeah, I think it's just the overall experience being and being on both sides. I haven't just been on the municipal side for all those years. I've been on the industrial side quite a bit. He, he's successful because look at how he's dressed. I mean, he comes in like that with probably like a, a little top hat. He got that little BS sign on him, and that's that's his. I say no, but 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 I do this. It, it's got. I'm having trouble with the background, but the fact is, it's it's a BS, like no BS. Oh, okay. You understand what I'm saying? And I think you know what this comes down to teaching you know i mean ed i think you, you can say this too is is that the industrial clients think oh man this is just a revenue generator you know type thing and there's no way and it's like okay um and and again like you say it's great to have the experience on both sides but if you sit down and talk with you know the industrial client for example this is this is why you're being charged a surcharge and this is what goes into to establishing that rate. Nowhere on that list do you see profit margin. They are just recovering their cost because you're killing them. <laughs> so now, let's look at let's look at your end of it. What can you do to clean up your act a little bit? And sometimes it is something very simple that if they took five minutes a day to do they would change the characteristic of their waste stream that's being sampled by the authority. And all of a sudden, hey, our surcharges went down. That's cool. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and, and it's idea. just, you know, enlightening both sides, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, are the, what are the conditions on the other side of the fence? Yeah, yeah, so and ed education and good communication. Absolutely. Okay, Eric, did you have yeah. a comment? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get overrun by Ed. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's, it's not a black and white thing. You're not either a hired gun or a trusted advisor. Uh, I can't recall how many small customers, clients I had that wanted a hired gun, but what they really needed was a trusted advisor. And so as you work with them over time, time's the only cure for, for that relationship, either they'll open up to having a trusted advisor or they'll keep with the hired gun. 
Uh, but it is a tricky tightrope to walk because sometimes you got to point out and say, you know, that didn't go well because you didn't ask an expert. And hey, if you have a problem like that in the future, just give me a call and uh, I'll give you five minutes. You know, we bill in 15 minute increments. So if it's less than 15 minutes, uh, I'll give you the, the free advice. <laughs> uh, you, you try to work with them so that they can see they can trust you. And a lot of times what I've found, especially again with smaller clients, is they want that hired gun because you're partly the enemy. You, they think you're going to try and take all their money and uh, they have trust issues you know, with these fancy engineers who come in with their top hats on. So. Okay. Yeah. I've heard about those situations. Ed? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, as H David was talking there and I was looking at him, uh, I became very interested in the background. It, 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 is that your summer home or is that falling water by Frank Lloyd Wright? No, well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, as you can see, I have a little bit of a water problem in my basement. So, oh, okay, um, okay. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm curious, uh, either Jeff or Mike, uh, either of you guys have experience um, playing the role of a hired gun for a client? Mike? Yeah, and I would say that, uh, you know, the hired gun position is not always the most fun position, right? It's normally, it can be a controversial position that you're brought into, right? The dispute resolution over a contractual issue, right? Um, uh, negotiating surcharges with an industrial user. Um, often those are not the most fun conversations for really either side of the table. And, you know, I've done it, uh, for both the industrial side. And then I've helped with dispute resolution for a contract we didn't design or manage, right? I have one of those going on right now where it's, you know, hired gun third party to resolve a, a common dispute. Um, you know, I think similar to the message I said before, one of the most important things when you're that hired gun is making sure that you have the most qualified and the, the rightfully qualified person there to help resolve the situation. Um, you know, and that's critically important, especially when you're in a controversial uh, situation or dispute that, you know, you're bringing the best people to your client so that they can favorably resolve the, the dispute that's at hand. So I was thinking that in that case, you don't necessarily want someone with like really good technical skills. You need the people skills to be able to read the room, read the people and try to well, manage conflict. Would you agree? Sure, I mean, that's a huge component, right? It depends on what the role is, right? If it's something with the public, absolutely, right? I mean, if you need to make presentations in a public setting, you know, that, that's critical to be able to convey whatever information you are trying to, to the public so that they can receive it and digest it appropriately. Um, similarly to the board. Um, yeah, it really depends. It's it's situation by situation. And, you know, as others said, you know, dealing with lawyers as well. I mean, they're always not, they're not technically savvy as well. We're, we're complementing their, their um, legal knowledge with our technical background. So that working partnership um, can also be very interesting. Okay. Tori? You know, Mike, Mike just brought up a really, it's, it has nothing to do with your particular question, but he brought up a really good point because I've seen this at, at meetings where I sat on the other side that's so crucial where engineers will come into a meeting and they're presenting um, uh, like a development plan or something like that to, to a board. And um, I've seen some engineers come in and the gentleman or the 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 um, the young lady or whoever they might have presenting might not be their technical person, but they're the person who knows how to talk to the board. They're, they they know how to present. They don't just throw up a billion slides and talk, you know, all the technical mumbo jumbo because the whole board within the first two minutes is a completely glazed over and it has no purpose. So. I, there's so much value in that that comment that Christine you made and Mike then further talked about having those certain individuals within your organization that really truly know how to connect with people because there's there definitely are people who have 
stronger people skills and talking skills than others. I'm not a hugely technical person, but I love I love to talk. I, I'm not going to kid anybody. I, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> Don't say anything. Don't tell anybody my secret. But I mean, it just depends. And and you should really, as 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 a company and with planning that goes into it, make sure that you know when you're going in to give a presentation or talk about a, a controversial subject matter or just a brand new project, make sure you've got the right people presenting it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the person who did the whole project. It could be somebody completely different that you brief and they're the ones who present it. It could it could make or break that that particular um, project getting um, the work done by that that firm. It really could. Yeah, I've seen it point. happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, we're taking questions from you guys throughout this roundtable. So we'd love to hear from you. Are there questions or experiences you've had? Uh, we can share them with everyone out there. And I see uh, Chip uh, Bilger had uh, mentioned when it comes to using your engineer as a hired gun, he suggested a good place is working with the DEP. Uh, so um, Eric, you're shaking your head. Have you seen uh, that be a, a good good way of uh, oh, yeah. getting this stuff done with the DEP? <laughs> It can be uh, like anything else, you know, it has two sides. Uh, I've had actually more success working with the DEP than working against them, you know, sort of getting in there to understand where they're coming from, making sure that they understand where we're coming from before we start the fisticuffs, you know? So when you have that relationship, like, yeah, I'm going to beat on you about this. I know you're going to beat on me about that. Uh, let's be nice and, and uh, at least not nice, at least professional. Uh, it does tend to make those processes work better. Um, I think when you're when you're going hired gun against DEP, like you're going to win, you you need to be absolutely sure you're going to win. Uh, I've worked with a few clients at, over the years and uh, folks that did not win, put it that way. And why not? Because they just thought they could get it, they could do it their own way. Yeah, they what they saw and perceived as weakness from the department's part was really more patience and uh, trying to work through a system. And they thought, yeah, we'll just, we'll fight this. Um, it wasn't my client, but you can look at Montoursville uh, sewer system. Back in the day when uh, the other folks in Lycoming County, um, you know, I was uh, working with Montgomery and Muncie who eventually became West Branch. When they had their plants redone in the in the early 70s for secondary treatment, they got 75 to 90 percent grant, and that helped their sewer rates be ridiculously low. Come the uh, early 2000s, when we had to start planning for major upgrades. On the flip side, uh, the good folks in uh, Montoursville fought the issue, and they fought hard. And at the end of the day, if you look at their rates, uh, you know eventually they were forced, they lost, they were forced to build a sewer plant. And you look at the much higher rates that came with that process along with the legal bills and everything else. Um, they didn't make out, they didn't save any money for their ratepayers uh, over the course of that long period because rates were so low for those facilities that got primarily grants. And then when it came time to do upgrades, it made it even harder to do an upgrade to a facility that had a higher debt load. So if you're gonna fight DEP, um, you know, you're going to need a good hired gun, but you also need to be realistic in what your chances of winning are. And a good hired gun can can really help you understand that. Mm -hmm. Other people ex with experiences uh, working with the DEP and uh, like how you can best help boards in that way. Uh, Ed, I, I think what Eric said have realistic expectations going in. Don't forget the DEP guys are trying to enforce regulations. You can't always bend the regulations, okay? Uh, so you got to pick your battles when you go to DEP. Um, you're not going to win every battle you have with DEP because they got regulations and they say certain things. And you say, well, can't you, can you modify that? Well, that regulation comes from EPA. Yeah, go. Try and amend that thing. You're not going to. So again, pick your battles. Get your best scenario, Okay. And that's not exactly what we wanted, but it's more than we had. Go home, be happy, you know? And, and again, there's a lot of different people around that have had experience dealing with DEP and there's some people that haven't. So make sure you are got a trusted advisor. The hired gun route, mm, that's a little shaky at DEP because they got all that regulation behind them. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard to battle. 
And would you say that when you're working with a DEP, is regulation, is that it? Or is there personal relationships you may have with oh, some no, people? Oh, no, there's no there? personality issues at DEP. That, that doesn't happen at all. It's strictly by the book. The interpretation of the regulations is cut and dry. There's no personal opinion there it's at all. Well, the, you're, that's, more, that's more the DRBC. That's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, like, my. Can go there. We could spend like another week on DRBC. Oh we, are, we are recording this, folks, so I, it is yeah. evident. <laughs> we can cut out sections if we need to. Just let me know. <laughs> Tori, what were you going to say? So, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed's got a good point. I mean, when you're I, in my role as compliance coordinator um, with Entech, and then previously when I was with um, Suez, um, it you're you're better off knowing where you have room to negotiate because you're not going to change the regulations that's not going to happen so um you you have to have an open mind going in and i the one thing that i've learned dealing with all the regulators that i've dealt with across the entire country um you have to communicate with them you have to talk to them sending them an email saying I disagree with this that doesn't mean anything you have to set up meetings you have to talk with them you talk to everybody and anybody you can talk to in the department to try and get a better understanding where there is some flexibility or negotiation um, that can happen but um because when you deal with one person um, necessarily and expect a regulation change just because you want it just like Ed said it's it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen. Uh, no hired gun is going to make that happen. That's that's legislation changes. But what can happen is you can start the ball rolling with um, considerations for um, future modifications to regulations and, and also negotiations for something that might be um, like like it Ed, Ed had mentioned, a lesser a lesser fine, a lesser uh, responsibility, whatever. But you, you have to go into those things with an open mind. Um, because if you don't, you will be sadly, sadly disappointed. Seriously. H. David? Yeah. And again, just to kind of further all the comments. I mean, personally, I, I found that regardless of, you know, who you're dealing with, I think a little bit of empathy, a little bit of respect for everybody's role in the process and, and who they represent. And, you know, these people put their pants on one leg at a time, just like us. So, I mean, if, if, if you afford them, you know, the, the respect that, okay, maybe deserve is that they should have, you know, to do their job. I think it just creates a better atmosphere for at least furthering the conversation or, you know, at least coming to some resolution to why you're there in the first place. I mean, everybody's got to recognize that, okay, we're all what? Environmental professionals, aren't we all after the same thing? Mm -hmm. And even if somebody doesn't believe that, if they hear that after a while, they're thinking, you know, I should probably change my tune a little bit about this. So you got to hope. <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay, so we spent some time talking about the board, their role in, uh, and the responsibilities, but the engineer, their role and responsibilities. What about the authority itself, uh, as far as their role and responsibilities uh, for the you know triangle or the team to work best together? So uh, I'm curious, anyone have any comments on that, or Jeff? Uh, Jeff, any 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 insight you can give us regarding what you've seen work best uh, with the role and responsibilities of uh, the authority, either both management and the operations staff? So the the clients I represent now are on the smaller side, so the uh, so Alberta's borough is a client uh, uh, that we represent, and uh, they, they not only does the borough council, they're basically in charge of running the, the fiscal operation of the borough, but they're also in charge of running the fiscal operation for the sewer authority. So there's no authority per se, it's run by borough council. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting dynamic. Um, the experience I've had with authorities in the past and, and thinking back at some larger clients when I worked at larger firms, um, it gets complicated because the authority gets so large that sometimes the message gets lost, you know, from, you know, the people that are the board members and then you have the authority director and he's trying to get the message down to everybody else. But, you know, personalities get involved and people start to lose sight of why we're all here. 
and put your personal, my, my experience has been that this, and I tell people, look, put your personal opinion aside, put your personal feelings aside. We're here to do a job. This is the goal. And that's where we need to be when we leave today. That's it. That's how I, that's how I see it. Okay, interesting. Anyone else, uh, some insight into how the authority itself and the, their management and, and operators can work best with the rest of the team, Eric? Yeah, it, it, as you know, Jeff said, it, it really depends on the size of the entity that you're dealing with and the complexity of their management structure. A lot of smaller clients don't have a management structure and it can really impede the uh, communications and the goal setting and steering that big cruise ship that is infrastructure. So uh, sometimes you'll find yourself uh, as the de facto managed by engineer situation where you've got a board that's asking you to effectively talk to their people or to carry out a project in a way that starts to cross the line where you're no longer just the engineer, but you're, you're also doing helping with the finances and uh, helping the people who keep the books, um, you know, improve how the books get kept. And that um, can be a little terrifying when you, you start getting into the weeds. Uh, it's how people, engineers get sucked into the private or the, the public sector sometimes, I would say. Um, but it, it really does come down to that flexibility and keeping your communication channels strong will help you keep the, the flexibility that you need to make sure that operations has a say. And the, even the people who answer the front desk, those poor souls that deal with um, the best and the worst of people on a daily basis, uh, you know, they need to have input into the process too. So uh, a good engineer can sometimes play all of those roles um, sparingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hold on that, Eric, that's a good point. So um, when you think about the management structure, that's important because, uh, you know, you've seen some organizations that run from top down. The edict comes from high on high and everyone has to follow it. Um, and that's, that's a good structure. But there's also, there also needs to be a return route, a return communication line from the people that are out popping the manhole lids doing the inspections that can communicate to their boss, that can communicate back up to the director. Like, you know, you asked us to do this stuff and we were fine with it, but why don't we do it this way next time? It'll be a lot better. And that's the best case scenario in my, my personal experience. Mm -hmm. It's the most effective. Anyone else with uh, some insight on, uh, as far as the workings of the uh, authority itself and their members? Okay. You know, we're going to do something a little special right now. So you guys don't know this is coming up, but this is something, something a lot of fun that we often do during these round tables. The lightning round. <laughs> I like the bell. <laughs> the crowd goes crazy. <laughs> A few of you have done this with me before. And what we do is I pose a question to everyone on the panel. You've got 30 seconds to answer. And uh, so in your opinion, uh, what personality trait makes best, or what personality trait makes for an ideal engineer who's working with a board or a council? So Tori, go. Good listener. A good listener, excellent. H. David, what do you think? I was going to say that. Too bad. <laughs> Clock is ticking. Hurry. Doesn't matter. I still have 20 seconds. Um, 10, nine. I, I'd, I'd say empathy. You know, I, I'd say, you know, put yourself in their shoes and, and what they're trying to overcome and what, what are they, what resources do they have mm -hmm. and make make up the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How'd I do? You're good. <laughs> You're right, because actually, <laughs> Steve Wagner said, you really didn't need to set a timer for some people. So you did good. <laughs> so I've got the dinger oh, ready to oh, go more than 30 oh. seconds. You're going to get the you hook. That. <laughs> Mike, Mike, what do you think as far as a trait or personality uh, uh, for the uh, engineer? Best working May, Maybe a bold statement here, but common sense. Whoa. Ooh. Oh, man. They're getting I better like and better. It. Eric, yeah. you're in trouble. You're the last one. Wow. Uh, Jeff, right? Jeff, right? Ed, uh, what do you think? Ed, what do you think? Talking. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> Check your ego at the door. <laughs> nice. Okay, so no ego. Very nice. Ed, what do you think? Yeah, I, and I think it goes along with Eric's ego statement. Talk to the people 
talk with them, talk to them. I, I said earlier, know your audience. Don't talk with a big ego. Don't talk like you, 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 you're you this highfalutin character. Um, explain things in ways they can understand. And and then, then you're going to communicate better. Excellent. And Jeff, what do you think? I, I would say uh, integrity. Uh, we are licensed nice. engineers. And uh, with that licensure comes special responsibilities. And it starts with being having honesty and integrity. If you if you see something that you think is wrong, speak up and tell them, look, we can't be doing it this way. It's wrong. Uh, I like someone before says something about knowing your limitation. I think it was Mike. We all find ourselves kind of wading out into the ocean too deep sometimes. It's, it's those of us who succeed, raise the hand and say, hey, I need some help, instead of trying to swim against the current. Uh, just and know your limitations. That that's where the integrity comes in. If you're honest with yourself and you're honest with your board and your employer, then you're going to succeed. Excellent. Very, very good. Uh, great answers. I love it. You. Well, I want to do it again. I got more. <laughs> <laughs> Tori, what else did you have? <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Be, well, be confident. I think be confident. And when you're talking to people, I people, they respond to that. They, they want, they want to know that you're you're excited to be there. You're confident in what you're doing and you're dedicated. And I think that's huge. That truly is you. Like, like that's, it, it helps. Like you feel that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some engineers may not, they may be young and nervous and not quite, don't have the people skills yet. Is it good to team with someone with more experience then? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, and H. David, you had your no BS sign up. You have to make that into real. Have have a Steve Wagner make your real one because I think you're going to be using that more. So um, no BS <laughs> is a key component of being a good engineer working with the board. Would you agree to H. David? Uh, well, yeah, and I, just like Mike, uh, when and Jeff says, just you know, integrity. You know, be honest. You know, understand what they need, and don't and don't be somebody you're not or you're not comfortable with so really and go right around the horn and incorporate everybody's comments into that it, it's something i have a question mm -hmm. is that is everybody able to audience included able to see the q a no no it's just the just us panelists i i think the one that's up there now is is actually worth reading is it okay yeah i wasn't sure um so this is from an anonymous attendee and they explain like any field, there are good and not so good consultants. A good consultant is responsive to the client and understands it is a privilege to work for them. Out of all the engineers they could have chosen, they put their trust in you. Infrastructure is often the biggest capital investment by most municipalities and particularly for small entities that do not have the internal expertise. They rely heavily on the consultant. Bad consultants have sadly had the attitude that if they're doing you a favor by working for you and have poor follow-up, failure to meet deadlines, providing information, et cetera, um, and every project is and should be important. The last thing a client wants to hear is, well, we have another big job and couldn't get your project done on time. These are the consultants who are one and done and not interested in building long-term relationships. There are many great consultants, but every coin has a flip side. So yeah, that is interesting to uh, under, and I, I'm, since it's an anonymous person, I'm not sure if that was a utility or a board member or who that was chiming in there, but yes, uh, interesting thoughts and ideas on the you know, roles of a good and a bad engineer. Uh, what do you guys think? Any comments on, on that one? Well said, well said. Absolutely. That ties, I think that ties everything we talked about as far as what's important Mm -hmm. all together mm -hmm. every project is important yeah yeah oh, and speaking of um the, what I we add, you know go ahead jeff i would, I would add, so we our last question was in one word what is a good uh you know what's a good word to, to have ex excellence or, what, or however you phrase it humble and i oh, think yes. that gentleman or that uh, you that person who put that question up is like, uh, and I've seen it before, you have some engineers, very arrogant. You should be happy that I'm taking my time to serve you. Humble yourselves. We have specialized <laughs> knowledge, but without a client who needs our specialized knowledge, we have no purpose. So I like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good point. I think oftentimes I've seen uh, engineers use that as a shield when they're uncomfortable or not confident that they will put up that, I'm the engineer, do what I say. 
uh, attitude that can engender you know, negative feelings and can make you a one and done engineer. But uh, as was said previously, be yourself. Um, the young guys who are out there, yeah, yourself is gonna be a little awkward. Uh, guys and gals, I should say, who are out there as engineers, you, you will be awkward. But as you get through it, you will become more confident and then your self will be confident. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, any of you who've been an engineer uh, working with the board, um, what do you do when you're a young one? If you're young and don't have experience, how do you, how do you make yourself feel more confident before you go in and speak to a board? You, you, talk to, you talk to somebody who has experience. You rely on the people within your organization or sometimes even outside of your organization. It, it doesn't matter. But talk to somebody who has experience and who can support you on your journey um, to, to get there because you, you shouldn't do it alone. That's, that's, that's what you know, makes you grow. So absolutely, it's you know, work with the people who've already been through you know, those initial experiences because they're going to help you. Going to help well, I'm almost, it. almost thinking if you are nervous and unsure, admit it. it, it that's not Absolutely. a weakness. That's the strength to confide in your boss, your coworkers that, hey, I'm not quite sure how to do this. Can I practice with you? Or can we just talk it through? So you really have an idea how, how, to, how to work on your people skills and, and best manage your clients. And it's, you're taking care of them. You're really trying to understand them and take care of them. It's a true, it's a true mentoring program. It, it is. And, and mentoring isn't just about, you know, how to do business or how to deal with clients. Mentoring can also be something where you're helping somebody deal with difficult situations that you've already dealt with. You know, why, why not help make it a little bit easier for them? Um, so absolutely. But Ed, go ahead. Yeah. In terms of that mentoring, I, I belong to the school. Did you ever hear that one where they take infants and they throw them in a swimming pool and they say they'll, they'll learn real quick how to tread water okay well there there used to be this young engineer at Entech, and i know he's tuned in today and i just said listen i can't make it to the public meeting that night you'll go for me you'll be fine everything will be okay you can handle it i called him up after the meeting i said how to go and he says they asked me to leave i said what, what the? <laughs> now the point is I throw him into the shark pool, but he learned something and he's much better at it nowadays. Okay? Does he talk, does he talk to you, Ed, anymore? Oh, yeah, all the time, all the okay. time. All right, just checking. But, but good mentoring, Ed. Time, it was one of the toughest clients we had. <laughs> Wait, so oh, honestly, honestly, Ed, like when you did that, was it truly with the intent of helping Brian to learn? What makes you think it was Brian? Oh, man. <laughs> yes, because at some you gotta point, go. you got <laughs> you to gotta release the apron strings. You got to throw the cub out of the den. You know, you got to push the eagle out of the net, whatever. And you have to also have a confidence that you've given him some mentoring. It was It was a funny story. It wasn't like he screwed the whole pooch or nothing, but it was just funny the way he said <laughs> they asked me to leave. <laughs> I have, I have some good advice in that regard because I'm bringing some uh, younger staff up through. Um, I will only send someone who who isn't experienced enough. You gotta like like I said, you gotta throw them out there. Like I, I can't spoon feed you for the rest of your life till you're 50 years old. Uh, you gotta throw them out there. But uh, what I do is I'll call my client in advance and I'll say, "Look, I can't make it to the meeting tonight. I'm gonna send this guy," and just he's young. He's very good, he's very talented, but he's inexperienced in the public realm. So just kind of take care of him for me, please. You know, and you can do that with some clients that you serve you and they get it. They understand like, hey, you know, Jeff can't be everywhere. I'm only one guy. So he's got other guys that kind of help. So I, I found that very effective. And I don't mention it to my guy who's going to the meeting because I want him to get nervous. I want him to have those, those butterflies. I want him to experience uh, a little bit of fear because it can be scary to go to some of these meetings. And uh, when you get through there and you and you succeed and you walk out at that at the end of the, that meeting, you're like, I can handle this. And that's confidence. That's what that's what I see lacking. With, you know, some guys that haven't done it enough, they don't have the confidence. Functional anxiety is good. <laughs> yeah, I that idea of priming your client ahead of time. I mean, it's so simple, it's brilliant. <laughs> and well, it goes back to Tori's communication thing. We keep hearing that over and over again. 
So I see we're coming up. We've got just a few minutes left. And uh, what I'd like to do is for our audience, um, something we always like to know is uh, we want some feedback from you guys on um, what other sort of roundtables you would like to have us present. So I've got another poll I'm going to launch in regard to future roundtables. So uh, which ones are of most interest to you? And we've got them both on the water, wastewater, and uh, industrial side. So uh, one we actually are doing, it's a have a beer with an engineer, and it's tied in with what would you tell your 21-year-old self? Uh, so I can't wait for that one. But uh, we want to try to bring more, you know, more of the uh, seasoned professionals, uh, both at NTech as well as in the industry, bring them in and, and share their advice with the younger people actually just as we've been doing right now uh, on you know, how do you get young engineers ready for uh, working with boards. So I'll give you five more seconds to give us some feedback in regards to future round tables. Okay, so I'm going to, oh, and it, you can answer more than once because often, I mean, there's a lot of good topics here. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna end the polling and let's take a look at the results. Uh, so it looks like the ABCs of wastewater treatment operations. Uh, looks like that's the, one of the most popular ones. And yay, have a beer with an engineer. So uh, I'm gonna be drinking beer in the future. Yes, can't wait. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much to our audience for giving us some feedback. That's really, really helpful. And um, to wrap things up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and show you guys that uh, speaking of future roundtables, we already have some on our schedule. So we've got four more essentially every two weeks through the rest of the year. And we plan on doing them into 2021 as well. So if you've got ideas for them. Let us know if you want to be on a roundtable. It's fun. It really, really is. So uh, we've got one with water, managing non-revenue water in November. Show me the money. I'd mentioned that earlier. More I&I. &I. We'll have Eric and Ed back for that one. And then beer with an engineer. Old timers share what they tell their 21-year-old self. And to wrap things up, uh, uh, just a reminder, if you want to sign up for these, register ahead of time. Go to our website. Uh, and at the bottom of ntecheng.com, bottom right side, you'll see a roundtable recast. That will take you to our blog where you can register for these roundtables and see videos of all of our past ones. So uh, huge, huge thank you to my panelists. Um, Chris wasn't able to join us, but big thank you to Ed, to H. David, to Eric, to Tori, and also to our special friends, Jeff Ott, as well as Mike Bizignani. So, so nice having you guys here. And we are sharing their email addresses they're passionate about these things, so they would love to talk to you about them and help you out. So uh, you're welcome to get in touch with them. And if you are interested in a PDH certificate or a operator CEH, uh, please send me an email. So I'm going to leave this up for another minute or so. Um, but uh, just to wrap things up uh, from my panelists, uh, do you guys have any final words of wisdom or any, mm -hmm. any comments that you'd like to share with our audience? It was a pleasure to, to chat about all this. It's fun to see the connection between all the entities we deal with, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, it is cool. And, and, and I just, I love getting everyone's, uh, the different perspectives from everybody out there. So it's wonderful. Uh, any other comments or things to share, anyone? Okay, then um, to wrap things up, the way I always like to end these roundtables. Well, first, huge, huge thank you to my panelists. You guys were fascinating, brilliant, and showed why you should be up here on the panel. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you so much to our viewers. We appreciate your questions. So, so helpful to know uh, what you're concerned about and how we can best help you. And finally, magical things happen when you bring together passionate people. You guys are clearly passionate about what you do. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Thanks you guys. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Thanks.